Well, friends, we come to our Bible reading. If you've got a Bible to hand, do turn to Joshua chapter 4, and our reading comes from verses 1 to 24, and uh, the Coopers are going to bring our reading for us this morning, and then Liz is going to speak to us. Today's reading is taken from the book of Joshua, chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, and tells the story of how Joshua commemorated the crossing of the Jordan by the Israelites with 12 stones. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from the Manga people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests stood, and carry them over with you, and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God, into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, and according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, What did these stones mean? Tell them, that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded. They took twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, as the Lord had told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to their camp, where they put them down. Joshua set up the twelve stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And they are there to this day. Now the priests who carried the Ark remained standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything the Lord had commanded Joshua was done by the people, just as Moses had directed Joshua. The people hurried over, and as soon as all of them had crossed, the ark of the Lord and the priests came to the other side while the people watched. The men of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Menasseh crossed over, armed in front of the Israelites as Moses had directed them. About 40,000 armed for battle crossed over before the Lord to the plains of Jericho for war. That day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel. And they revered him all the days of his life, just as they had revered Moses. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Command the priests carrying the Ark of the Testimony to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests, Come up out of the Jordan. And the priests came up out of the river carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. No sooner had they set their feet on the dry ground Then the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and ran in flood, as before. On the tenth day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal, on the eastern border of Jericho. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the twelve stones they had taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, In future, when your descendants ask their fathers, What do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan just what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the people of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to be with you again, uh, looking at this passage from Joshua 4 and thinking about God's hand of power. 
My dog, Ollie, uh, once fell into the river locks when it was in full flood. We were walking along the canal path at Drunjwick and he wandered onto that bridge over the river and uh, because he was losing his sight, he just sort of wandered off it and into the flood. Luckily, I saw him go and luckily he was a spaniel and a great swimmer. Now, I really love my dog, but... I took one look at that raging water and, you know, the tree trunks being swept away in it. And I knew I was not going in there after him. Uh, so I scrambled along the bank, fighting my way through the vegetation, trying to keep calm and calling out encouragement. And wonderfully, he kept his head up and he steered for my voice. And despite the roaring current, he made landfall at a place where I could reach him and haul him out. Uh, you can be sure it was the last time I ever walked my blind dog off the lead. So I know that that moment on the bank of the Jordan was truly terrifying. After 40 years of faffing about in the desert, and honestly that is always how it seems to me, they are finally standing on the banks of the Jordan looking out over the promised land. Up to now, it has been procrastination on a national and generational scale. They've had God's promise to Abraham. They've had Moses lead them out of Egypt and the tyranny of Pharaoh. They've had the protection of Yahweh who parted the waters of the Red Sea, allowing them to escape into this desert and then sustained them all the way through it, keeping them fed and watered and clothed and they have prospered along the way, albeit even quail probably gets tedious after 40 years. They have pretty much had everything on a plate. And if you can become institutionalized in a desert, I think that has what has gone on. So, you know, on the off chance, I Googled how long it would take to trek from the Red Sea to the River Jordan in just one journey, obviously, camping at night, uh, you know, but getting on with it and taking the most direct route. Uh, I did think it was a bit of a random question, but gotta love the internet. The answer came back straight away. 40 days. 40 days versus 40 years. Wow, God is patient with us, isn't he? Uh, you know, without going through the whole sorry tale of Exodus, they just made it so complicated that it was 40 years before they were ready to accept the gift of home. Anyway, the past is the past. They are finally here, ready to cross over. But today, the river isn't ready. It's in flood and it's very dangerous. People still regularly drown in the Jordan every year. Most of the time, it is peaceful and relatively easy to wade across. A lot of the time you won't even get your knees wet in most places. But in flood, it is raging and the waters conceal huge boulders and all sorts of treacherous debris on the move. So I think you can imagine the people crying out to God, you have got to fix this. We need to cross now. Oh, this is terrible. And God is like, 40 years? 40 years to make a 40 day journey and today this is my fault? Sometimes, you know, we need to realize that God's perspective on our prayer requests are, is a little different from ours. I definitely relate to this moment. But thankfully for me and thankfully for them, God is not only patient, he is also gracious. And in this lovely mirror image of the parting of the Red Sea, God shows his hand in amazing power and he holds back the raging waters to make a safe path for the people to get across. And they hurry across. Are they full of faith? Well, you know, I'm not so sure. The Bible tells us the people scurry past the miracle just in case perhaps it's going to be time limited. They were seriously intimidated by this great force of nature. You know, they did not swagger across. They did not stop halfway to admire this beautiful miracle in front of them. They hurried. I like that. 
and I find it encouraging. Courage, you know, is not about feeling something. It's really about putting one foot in front of the other. And that is why faith is such a great companion to our courage. You put your faith in him and you can allow yourself to feel all the anxious as long as you just do it. Because when God shows his hand, we just need to show up. So uh, that brings me to the whole business of the stones. And I wonder if you have ever picked up a stone from a beach or a stream to take home as a souvenir. Here's one I found lying around my house. Uh, And in this story, one person from each tribe goes back into the riverbed and collects a memorial stone. Now, I don't think we're talking pretty pebbles here, okay? I'd like to bet that there was a bit of machismo about which tribe's best athlete hauled out the mightiest boulder. I suspect it was a bit of a mini Olympics, actually, with everyone rooting for their team. And why not, you know? This moment is all about identity. God is at work here to remind the people of their true identity, to restore that identity to them after all that time in the desert because belonging to each other in God is their greatest strength and it is the key to their future. If you asked a historian or a political scientist how they would describe this group of people who crossed the Jordan together, They would say that they were really just a loose alliance of tribal clans. Those 12 tribes descended from the sons of Jacob, together the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. Now in many ways they have lost that identity in the wilderness and you know wilderness experiences will do that to you. Time then to remind them who they are. The stones are set up one by one so that each person can come to this place and find their own belonging in the greater whole, in the bigger story. Folk are instinctively tribal, but now it's time to take that identity a step further. Joshua knows that it starts with their belonging to their tribe and he knows that's a good thing and it's God-given. But now God wants them to have something more, something even better, and the most powerful weapon they can have against whatever threats or challenges lie ahead. It's unity. No one is abolishing the tribes, far from it. Those clan loyalties, those support networks remain a vital connection and a strength to each one of them. But now they have to be more than just an alliance of tribes. They have to remember that they belong to something so much greater than themselves and with so much more significance and power for that future. Because this is a new world over on this side of the Jordan. That uh, theme of Exodus and the promised land will be echoed many times for this nation in the centuries to come. 900 years later, the Babylonians will carry them off into exile in Mesopotamia. After a couple of generations, they will return again. And the focus of that return to the promised land will be to build a new Jerusalem and a new temple under the leadership of Nehemiah. I, though, can never consider this story about crossing the Jordan without thinking about John the Baptist. He is the biblical character that I associate with this place. Uh, It's probably a much more peaceful picture, uh, gently flowing waters, in which those seeking the longed-for Messiah are commissioned for a new life of discipleship. And you know, the banks of the Jordan are not just a convenient water supply for John at this point. It's absolutely symbolic and it is absolutely meant, I think, to connect straight back to Joshua leading the Israelites through the flood with, you know, a lightning crackle. 
And John is doing something really interesting and subversive because he's very deliberately standing on the other side of the river. His would-be disciples have to wade across to get to him, leaving the promised land behind. He ministers to them on the desert side, that place of preparation. And there they reaffirm their identity as God's holy people. And they make a fresh start with him before they return to a new Israel. The desert is a place of discomfort, of procrastination, of preparation, of forgetting ourselves in order to discover our true identity. For every wilderness, there is a promised land and for every promised land, there is a river Jordan that I must be crossed. Each one of us could tell a story of time in the wilderness, I'm quite sure. In the wilderness, we walk and we walk and we walk and we get nowhere. It can be a lonely experience, but there are also times when we do that wandering together. And times of national crisis are certainly one of those. It seems clear to me that this time of pandemic is just such a one. All the messages from the scientists and the government are telling us we still have a way to go. We may have tentatively made our way back to church in small numbers over the past few weeks, but we're a long way from reclaiming this building of ours as the comfort zone it used to be. It's all too easy to focus on our personal relationship with God and the little arc of our own lives. But sometimes God needs us to pull back our focus onto our tribe, onto our nation. For our nation, for the whole human race right now, that promised land is probably a vaccine and a much fuller understanding of how to live with this virus in the long term. For our tribe, the church, could it be that this time away from our building, from our comfortable rituals, from our friends we seek out at coffee time, is full of God's purpose? In all the biblical stories of exile and return, there always seems to be this time in the middle of stripping away all the artifacts of religion, followed by a re-sanctification and reminding of us who we really are. Are we ready for God to say that we have to be a different generation? The days when everybody came to church are just about within living memory. The days when we could all just come to church and have it all on our institutional spiritual plate are only a couple of months ago, but the reality is very different this morning. And meanwhile, a whole generation has grown up who have no place of connection, no sense of belonging to the blessings and promises of God in Christ Jesus. Those miraculous stones lifted up from their dry place at the bottom of the river are really meaningful. Twelve stones representing the completeness of God's provision and that our identity is in him. Those stones placed on the other side, claiming the ground for a new Israel, the forerunner of God's kingdom. It's such an important moment, memorialising all that God has done and drawing a line in the sand between the past and the future. It's a new start. They're going to be strangers in their promised land. Perhaps we should try it sometime because Jesus has promised to go ahead of us and prepare the way. When we stand on the edge of something new, it may look like we have to jump blindly into a raging, raging flood and have faith that God will somehow allow us to survive. But if God is who he says he is, then we are who he says we are, his children, his people, and we can call out to him to show his hand in power for our families, for our nation, for unity and for a vaccine, for an ultimate return to church that recommissions us as his people, focused on his coming kingdom, not just settling back into our comfort zone. 
It's challenging and discomforting, I know, but God is annoying like that. There are lots of Jordan moments in life when we stand on the edge. And you know, Jesus isn't just waiting on the other side. He stands right there with us, even when you can't see what's on the other side. Seeing that rock pile and hearing the story of the people of Israel, they would always know that they hadn't crossed the Jordan on their own. Those stones cried out, God is in this. He did this. By his hand, we have forded this river. His power and faithfulness have accomplished this. This is a season of great uncertainty and stripping away of all our comfortable ways of doing things and of being church. I am so sure that God is in that, that this is a preparation for something new, for a renewal of our commitment to build the kingdom here. I believe it is a time to take your identity a step further, to be found in him, whatever your tribe may be. When God shows his hand, we just need to show up. So will you join me in praying into that? Loving, faithful Father, we lift up to you all those who feel stuck in the desert or held back by a flood of obstacles. It's hard to be thankful for places of preparation and uncertainty. But we do pray it, Lord, because we trust in your love. So thank you that there is another side and a future. Give us the courage to claim your protection and to give you sovereign power over how you intend us to get there. In all places and all situations, whatever our tribes, we need to be found in you first and last. Lord, we cry out for your hand of power over those working for vaccines and therapies that can transform this crisis. Make us into a holy people who can be an army of prayer for our nation and to bring your love and truth to our community because we ask it in the wonderful and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, friends, as we reflect on what Liz has said to us and the way the Lord has spoken to us through her words, we're going to sing again at our contemporary service. We're going to acknowledge God's power to give us life and hope as we pour out our praise and sing to him, Great are you, Lord. At our traditional service, we're going to sing this hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Uh, as we looked for videos of this hymn we could sing to, uh, trying to find one with a, an organ and the words on the screen and good congregational singing was a bit tricky. Uh, you just need to be aware that they will get to the singing in this hymn, but there is quite a long introduction. It's about a minute and a half uh, of just the organ playing before the singing starts. But let's sing. 